the joke I prefer is, is when you're work, talking about the book uh, Orientalism, though some things are better left unsaid. <laughs> How long have you been waiting for that? <laughs> it comes up more than you think, actually. But the, it doesn't always get a laugh, but, so I appreciate that. <laughs> And and the listener won't realize it. Gabe had to think about that for a section second because he's uh, he is wearing a tiki shirt and he is in what appears to be a cocktail bar, but is actually just a friend's uh, home cocktail bar. That's right. It's a particularly well equipped uh, friend's dining room. Yeah, uh, and and it's uh, and it's it's lovely to be here. And I appreciate uh, James and Laura for uh, for hosting the uh, the the travel studio. But I'm joined as I am every fortnight by uh, Ken Holyoke, who unfortunately <laughs> does not appear to be sitting in a cocktail bar, appears to be sitting in his home office in Lethbridge, Alberta. How are you, Ken? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being in the home home office. It's the difference in you're able to wear a, a tiki shirt and I am currently wearing a sweater <laughs> because because it's still only about nine degrees here. Uh, and uh, we had a frost warning last night. So, Oh, my goodness, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, everybody on the East Coast is, is experiencing ungodly hot weather. Um, we, are, we are experiencing the complete opposite. So, Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Do the Right Thing, the Spike Lee film, Ken? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, well, I, I had as I was driving here today and thinking about how to do the opener, I had, I had this thought that I should do it exactly like the opener to the – the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing, which is it's, uh, it's uh, you know, in Bedford Stuyvesant or somewhere and it's stiflingly hot and there's a there's a radio voice comes on and uh, I believe it's wake up, wake up, wake up. And then w- awakening the city uh, during this atrocious uh, heat wave. But um, since I didn't do that, the listener is going to I'm going to encourage the listener to go <laughs> check out the uh, the introduction to Do the Right Thing. And, uh, yeah. And, 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 and it's also possible. I had done that. Also possible by the time this airs, uh, there won't be a, a, a heat wave as much. That is also our, our, possible. Our weather commentary sometimes is completely out of step with uh, when the when the episode <laughs> comes out. <laughs> well, it, it's one of these things is that uh, is that that time is uh, a straight arrow only sometimes and not, exactly. not here on the New Brunswick uh, Archaeology yeah, It's a flat podcast. circle on the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast. That's right. But uh, Ken, we're uh, sponsored as we are just about every fortnight by the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick and by the ULEF Shirk Exchange Grant. Uh, and we, we thank them for their support um, of this program. Uh, and I think we also wanted to wish everyone uh, happy Pride. Yeah, yeah. Uh, June is Pride Month, and, and uh, you might see a little bit of a logo change for us for the, for the month for the podcasts. And we celebrate it every day, but uh, wanted to draw attention to it in particular for the month of June. Exactly right. And I think one other thing we wanted to do, Ken, just before we get started here, um, we may have picked up, we hope, some new listeners uh, in the last uh, you know, month or two, in part because uh, the Canadian Archaeology Association uh, very kindly awarded us the Public Communications Award. So uh, hopefully got some recognition uh, that this podcast is something folks can tune into. Um, so we would like to welcome you if you're joining us from hearing about us there. But we've also just had a paper out in the most recent SAA archaeological record yeah. about this very podcast. Yeah, so it's called Podcasting and Public Archaeology, the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast um, by by myself and, and Gabe. And, and uh, uh, the premise is sort of exactly what we had talked about at the CAAs, um, essentially using a podcast as potentially a public archaeology tool. Um, uh, the great thing about SAA archaeological record, too, is that uh, this is a an open access um, resource, and so anybody who's listening to the podcast or anybody who is interested um, can actually read the SAA archaeological record, even if you're a non-member. Um, so we'll put a link to the um, to the issue in the show notes um, and welcome you to the show. And, and I think, Gabe, you have some production notes and guidance for for new new listeners. We do. We, we have we have some tips for for the new listener. And, and the first uh, tip, I guess, Ken, is we should just outline. The absolute uh, most important thing about getting into the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast is you can start anywhere except episode one. 
the, <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> which, you know, honestly, if we had that to do all over again, we, we, might, uh, we might have reconsidered our approach there. Episode one is not very useful. Um, you you can listen to- unless you unless you like awkward silences and you and I being very like audibly nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I would say is, is if you're a completist, you should someday go back. It's sort of the Silmarillion of, uh, <laughs> of the New Brunswick Archaeology <laughs> podcast. I don't think the Silmarillion's all over the place, but nothing nothing about that is as elegant <laughs> as uh, Tolkien's writing. That's <laughs> <laughs> Although Ken was smoking a gigantic pipe during it. We're not sure <laughs> yeah, exactly. What was, what was yeah. in there? Um, and uh, but the uh, what we there's kind of two ways you might get into this, and and one option would be you could just start at uh, episode two in our first season. And start from there. And that's probably ideal if you're particularly interested in um, starting with the culture history um, of New Brunswick and the far northeast more broadly. Um, and then the other option would be starting the second season, which we're, which we're in right now, we engage uh, more topically. So if you're – and the, you can dip in and out of that in more or less any order It's uh, in the second season. It's going to make, still make sense. With a few exceptions, there's a couple of – episodes that really go together. So we have one about um, uh, professional avocational collaborations. It makes sense to listen to those um, all at once. Uh, anything else you'd like to add about how to listen to this, Ken? Yeah, yeah. And so if you are going kind of the culture history route, um, you can sort of go chronologically from episode um, two, which is sort of a short history about New Brunswick archaeology. But starting with three, we start with Paleo-Indians. And basically episodes three, four, six, uh, 8, 9, 10, and uh, 11 and 12 basically go from Paleo-Indian to uh, early to late archaic, and then from early, middle, and late uh, woodland, uh, then into the post-contact period, basically. So um, so essentially, you you can run chronologically through the first uh, first season and jump in and out of culture history there um, alongside some some interesting... Uh, sidebars into um, one of, I think probably one of our, among the most useful episodes for people that I've heard feedback on is um, an interview we did with Bill Farley uh, early on in the podcast about publishing in archaeology. So, and that's uh, episode, episode five from the first season. That's right. So, um, and we would just like to say, uh, we also encourage, uh, especially uh, new listeners, longtime listeners, whoever, um, to be in touch with us through our email address, which is, what is our email address, Ken? Our email address is newbrunswickarchaeology at gmail.com. That's New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word. Archaeology spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y. New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. That's right, listeners, new and old. And, and one of the things that you might want to use that email address for is, despite, uh, we're nearly into episode three, or season three here, Ken. That's right. And one of the uh, things that has not happened is we've not renamed this podcast. Despite me sitting in uh, Connecticut, we are still the <laughs> New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, despite you sitting in Alberta. You know, we've really just expanded uh, dramatically beyond the original confines, I think, of that of that name. We're, um, we're bursting at the seams like I started uh, bursting at my suit jacket uh, during the pandemic <laughs> of, of, our, of our region here. And uh, so one of the things that we would encourage you to do is if you have uh, a better name for this podcast to send it in. And we would not just shamelessly steal a listener's IP. We would make sure that you are appropriately compensated for renaming this podcast. And, and Ken, if, if someone renamed the podcast this fortnight, what would uh, what would they win? Well, so it's mid-June um, and uh, and. I wrote. You can tell I wrote this a couple of days ago because it says, it says my garden is coming along. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. So the garden is probably shocked right now after what has happened the last couple of days. But uh, the tomatoes and tomatillos are thriving. The hot peppers are flowering. Peas are crawling their way up the trellis. And my garlic scapes are curling up, nearing ready for harvest in the coming weeks. We all know the satisfaction that a garden can bring, and in these inflationary times, what a garden can do in terms of your f- own food sustainability and keeping that pocketbook from getting too light. Ken, I'm just going to pause you here, here, here briefly. This is, this is getting very close to an advertisement that's going to be followed up by one with us telling the listener to buy gold and ammunition, but that's okay. <laughs> well, stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> 
And while I garden with my own family in my own backyard, a growing chorus of research seems to indicate that gardens are the way to go no matter where you are, urban, suburban, or rural. In fact, according to Dr. Jill Litt at the University of Colorado Boulder, it's not just the gardening itself that has benefits. Community gardens in particular promote sociality and appear to have physical benefits from an increased intake of fiber in your diet to an average of 42 additional minutes of physical activity in a week, potentially wow. reducing the risk of cancer and chronic disease over your lifetime. And Gabe, we're Depends all about- what you're drinking while you garden, but yeah. Exactly, exactly. We're all about sustainability on the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, and we're certainly promoters of living a healthy lifestyle, and that's why this week's prize pack, to be awarded to that lucky listener that gives us a new name, focuses on food security and potentially economic benefits. That's right, listeners. The NB ArcPod has been hard at work negotiating with municipalities, which ones we can't share right now, to secure for you your very own plot of land to till and the plowshare and tools to bring it to life. Now, we're pragmatic gardeners and we're thinking ahead on the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast in order to maximize yield for the foodstuffs and profits in your own agri-food industry. This community garden plot will be focused on producing that lender of labyrinths, the buddy to butter, the maker of mascots for NCAA teams from Illinois to Iowa. That's right, corn. Yes, the great-grandchild of Teucinte balsas, the tropical grass that over 10,000 years of domestication can now be found in co- cob form in cans, frozen food, food aisles, livestock feed, and a variety of fuels, plastics, and according to the Texas Farm Bureau, everything from antibiotics to frankfurters to rayon. Now, Arthur, our, our upcoming guest, is going to tell us a little bit whether or not Champlain did or did not see cornfields at Shuakoet. But we know that they that they abounded in the, both the pre- and po- post-contact period. We can assure you that the urban community garden that the NB ArcPod has secured for you has maximized the corn heat units so that you too can become your most amazing self. You'll not only be able to feast off of the delicious golden bantam, make tortillas from your Hopi Blue, and pop your glass gems, you'll be able to distill high fructose corn syrup, plastics, and ethanol from your Dia de San Juan or Oaxacan green varietals. Alongside this abundance of corn stalks, you'll be provided with a legend forced 16 inch 13.5 amp corded electric tiller cultivator. Now, this powerful 13 amp motor has a speed of up to 370 RPMs. It quickly loosens the hard soil while providing reliable s- stability, even doing uh, in the most efficient way. Yeah. Can we do RPMs in meters per parsec, too? Can we do that? <laughs> I don't know. Moreover, the sharp tines of the blades ensure it's easy and long-lasting work. It's equipped with a six high-hardness blades, adjustable tilling width of 40.6 centimeters or 38 arpents, while the depth can reach up to 20.3 centimeters or 32 85 of a mile. Meeting your needs for trenching and deep planting, we'll also provide the seeds that you need, organize a team of community helpers, and Gabe and I will bring our own trowels, shovels, and green thumbs to the party. Yes, whether it's hitherto not been observed, there will be no mistaking that you, quote, till and cultivate the soil when you next sham- when the next Champlain stops by, and you'll not just be sated, more socially and physically fit, you'll be going out and rounding up to the next dollar if you, lucky listener, can name the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. Wow, what a, what a prize, Ken. And that's right, uh, lucky listener, inch by inch or uh, meter by meter, row by row, uh, Ken's going to make sure that, uh, that this garden's going to grow. And Ken, if the lucky listener has the kind of name that would uh, cause us to, uh, I, I was going to say inflict that prize on them, but the uh, <laughs> but gift that prize to them. Where would they send it in? They're going to send it to New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. That's New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word, archaeology spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y, New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. That's right, Ken. And if you reach into that mailbag, uh, what do you see? What we see is uh, our usual, our usual uh, uh, bag of goodies from Podcorn. Um, mm-hmm. We also have an invitation. A very appropriate. Uh, Podcorn could be the name of that prize we just offered. It could be actually. Yeah, maybe maybe yeah. they've been listening. We all might along. be getting into a copyright problem, but they, yeah, um, we have a uh, uh, somebody appears to have sent us a PayPal transfer from a crypto account. Um, uh, so thank you for that, Stanfield Herman. Um, so, uh, we'll be sure to, uh, I'll be sure to give them all of our relevant information to yeah. accept that payment. Uh, but we do actually have a couple of pieces of mail. And so our first, um, uh, our first email comes from Andrea and she says, hello, Ken and Gabe. It's nice to meet you at the CAA conference in Saskatoon. I really you enjoy too, your Andrew. podcast. 
So sorry that it took me so long to get back to you, more than a fortnight even. Would you still be interested in having a chat sometime about climate change adaptation, archaeology, and our plans for community stewardship program in Nova Scotia? Well, Andrea, we would absolutely love that. And uh, uh, we will be reaching out to you in the coming weeks. So thank you for reaching out. Um, Thank you, Andrea. Nice to meet you uh, in Saskatoon. Yeah. And we also have an email from David... Uh, from Dave, and it says, Hi, Ken and Gabe. Congrats and thanks. Congratulations on receiving the CAA's Public Communications Award. You certainly have earned that distinction for, among other things, showing that it is still possible to have fun with New Brunswick archaeology. And thanks again for inviting me to talk about the life and times of Sam Sam Bliss. Cheers and a tip of the flip mug, Dave. Well, Dave, that is is certainly on the, the... the flip is definitely on the list of things that we have to do sometime this fall. I think that's going to be I agree. A, a key component of uh, um, your, maybe your your hosts actually have all the equipment they need to I, to produce a flip right behind you. They, I think they do. I mean, the uh, the it might be a, a jungle juice style flip, but I think we could <laughs> we could do it here. The uh, yeah, and thanks very much for that, Dave. And uh, we appreciate you having you on it. And um, we should have actually said, I guess, for the for the new listener, if, if you're a sort of listener that wants to focus specifically on, you know, you don't you want to um, you don't really want to go for the veggies. You know, you want to cut right for dessert. We've uh, we do these great sites episodes where we're going to have one right now, actually, uh, through the through the miracle of uh, time travel and digital technology and so forth. Um, but we focus on particular sites around the region and talk to the folks that excavated them or, or worked on them. Yeah, and uh, Dave did one about the uh, Sam Bliss Homestead, which yeah. includes uh, recipes and bar shot and <laughs> anything you could possibly want. Yeah, bar shot that is not like a uh, you know like your five star whiskey. Like we're talking about like yes. an actual lead bar shot. That's right. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. kind that looks like a particularly aggressive piercing my students might wear. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Some some things are better left unsaid, Gabe. That's uh, oh oh right yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, the the uh, you know the 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 joke I prefer is is when you're work talking about the book uh, Orientalism. Though some things are better left unsaid. You know? <laughs> How long have you been waiting for that? <laughs> it comes up more than you think, actually. But the, it doesn't always get a laugh. But so I appreciate that. <laughs> we are joined now by Dr. Arthur Anderson, who is an associate teaching professor at the University of New England in Biddeford, Maine, where his research focuses on the proto-historic and woodland periods in the far northeast, human engagement with coasts and coastlines, community archaeology, indigenous lithic technology and lithic exchange networks, and archaeologies of culture change and contact. He received his honors BA and his MA, Roman Strand, I think he's wearing that Roman Strand now, listener, um, and his PhD from Durham University. His publications have appeared in such publications as Journal of Island and Coastal Archaeology, Archaeology of Eastern North America, and Advances in Archaeological Practice. And today we're going to be talking to him about uh, Site Maine 5.06 in Biddeford in southern Maine. It's a, Arthur is very strategic about this. He has a site that he works on that is uh, almost within eyesight of his office, which I, I highly recommend. It's a real, um, he's really outdone himself on not just working near a picnic table, but also working near uh, his office. And I can tell Ken is confused because Arthur is broadcasting from the same corner that I did the last (laughs) podcast from. It's uh, it's uh, all of these um, uh, New England vistas that I'm I'm being treated to. (laughs) (laughs) He's seen people podcast in front of all of the best liquor cabinets. It's, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I was I was going to say, Gabe, you seem to have gotten um, a new shirt, a haircut, <laughs> and a new home and or liquor cabinet. <laughs> yeah, well, the uh, well, Arthur, when you listen to the program, you'll get the backstory about where I am. Okay. Um, but the I, I I believe it was you who who in the field uh, just uh, maybe two weeks ago said said to me, Gabe, did your partner do this thing where she buys you fun shirts? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we had that that shared uh, that shared experience. But uh, how are you, Arthur? I'm doing well. Uh, the listener will rec- will recognize uh, Arthur Anderson. Uh, he's spoken to us at uh, Member Two, and also at the UNB Field School last year. I believe you've been on the pod. You you might be the most. Is your third time on? This might be a record. Yeah, you get you get the green jacket now, Arthur. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> My fourth time, you'll see me wearing it. Yeah. <laughs> no, you won't. It's a podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I think, louder and uh, ready to go. Excellent. Uh, could you start by telling us what is an M.A. Roman Strand? 
Oh, I, that was actually my first question. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Um, the master's bound to getting what the others are. Cause it was a long time ago, but the, the master's program, um, covered, I, I think there was a, uh, Roman, uh, prehistoric and a near Eastern section or, oh. or strand. Oh. oh, so it's not like a, you don't get like a piece of cordage that you wear like over your shoulder or something. No, unfortunately it's not an actual accessory. It's just that, um, it, it, I mean, it's, it, academia has worked very hard recently on, um, all of these different terms to subdivide any kind of there are tracks there are there are strands there are streams there are all sorts of we're weaving over it. Yeah. yeah synergies everywhere yeah you could tell Durham's an old university because that would be the Roman micro credential now I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it is I should do yeah. <laughs> um, but so, anyway Arthur the reason we have you on here is because you're going to tell us about the site you work on now which is not Roman um, and it is a site in Biddeford Maine um, and it's sort of famous because Champlain visited it in 1605 and described uh, in Amishqua village there. Um, and then later in 1607, I believe, it's the site of a raid that's led by Member Two, the Mi'kmaq Grand Chief from near Port Royal. Um, and so I was wondering if you just start by, in kind of broad brushstrokes, telling us the nuts and bolts of the site. It is a site that's best known, as we say, because Champlain um, visited, well, the site is a moving target, I suppose, when you have a what looks to be a very broad site over an entire landform and thousands of years of occupation. But the spot at the mouth of the Saco River, uh, Champlain visited in 1605, um, drew a chart of the area and, and wrote a couple pages uh, recounting his experience with the people there. Uh, that is the reason the site's received a lot of focus over the years. You know, we, we have this European account, we have this European drawing of a site that's there, we know a site's there, we look for a site there. Um, so Champlain in 1605 has really kind of dominated people's perception. Um, and I guess as we'll get into of, of maybe what should be there um, and of, of what we expect. Um, but I think it's been interesting in a site that kind of uh, challenges those expectations in ways that I think are, are productive um, for archaeologists. And just actually, so one of the things that Gabe mentioned is it's called site 5.06 and, and we've have predominantly I mean, we have a lot of listeners in the States who actually know what this system is, but we have a lot of listeners in Canada who actually wouldn't recognize why we'd be... So we've talked about the Borden uh, site identification code. And so can, just to step back a second, 5.06, can you explain why in Maine it, it's, a, it's a different system and, and what, those, uh, what that designator means? Yeah, I can try. Maine uses a different system um, from much of the rest of the country. We don't use the Smithsonian trinomials that break... Um, site designations down uh, by county within the state. Um, we use a different system for prehistoric sites that works on, I believe, um, the 1947 seven-minute um, USGS maps. I think so. Um, I have one taped <laughs> to my file cabinet. And I, I have so, one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I was zooming from my office, you'd see the, the one taped behind me on the wall. Um, but basically, um, Maine is, is divided into a, a series of... Um, a series of squares based on early mapping. Um, and within those sites are then numbered sequentially. So it just so happens that Biddeford uh, lies in the five square or quadrant. And uh, it was the sixth site to be recorded there. Um, so, so fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, was actually, you know, what, what we call it is a good thing to talk about um, it, because Champlain records uh, in his map and his, in his account, um, the name of I think what he actually says is the name of this place, which is nice and vague um, in, <laughs> in, in terms of what he's actually talking about or, or the extent to which he even knew what he was talking about as he's encountering a language. He'd been reading there. Basso. That, uh, that's how he... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, he'd had a particularly long winter earlier to catch up on his reading, hadn't he? Was that... His... <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, a little, he was a little busy that winter. Um, so... Champlain records the name of the place as I'm, I'm going to say Shuakoat. That is uh, my pronunciation of what he writes. Um, I, I checked in with Tad Baker, who wrote a great article about the Alamushakui and, and potential um, sort of ethnicity and affiliation in, in this area. Um, so I, I, I trust um, I trust Tad on this, and I was pleased that we had come to the same conclusion. But there are various other ways of pronouncing it that sound a little more like Sako, but Shuakoat. Uh, I guess kind of in line with Pentagoa and other early place names is um, 
how I've been waltzing around saying what Champlain wrote, and uh, nobody's openly laughed at me about that yet. It's got the heavy metal umlaut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is nice. The moment I thought somewhere, yeah. And you brought up you brought up something interesting too, like about the about the chart. So there's the description of the people that are are there, and this description of this place. But there's also depiction of what's going on at that place that has driven a little bit of the archaeological work and kind of given the background to why people are so fascinated by Shuakoet in particular. Um, and and I think yeah, and your your paper in the Far Northeast volume kind of breaks down what exactly was this this cartographic depiction of Shuakoet representing? Like, is it is it an actual map? Can it be thought of that way? Um, or is it a chart? Uh, like, it's more, I think your point is that it's more accurate on the, with the sea numbers than it is with what's going on in the land. Yeah, I, I think that's important. And, you know, perhaps out over my skis a little bit in cartographic philosophy on this one. But um, I, I think it, it, has been, it has been called a map and it has been treated as a map. And if we look at what it depicts, um, you know, and, and, and I think all archaeologists sort of understand, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a hard thing. We're trying to grasp the past. And here we have might be a picture of it, right? So there, that, there's kind of a, a real attraction to that, that that is um, something that can be kind of a touchstone of, of truth. And, and we can start to work from there in a way that we don't always get to as archaeologists. But I think when we look at the details of that chart, um, it does show some important things about the landscape, right? It shows a sort of an open landscape, um, some, some trees scattered around, some fields of corn beans and squash, uh, a couple of different types of architecture, um, you know, longhouses behind palisades, wigwams, and Champlain writes about these things. So we get a, a very broad sense of the landscape in terms of what was going on, but it, it depicts a an enormous area if we, if we kind of roughly superimpose that on a modern map. And, and these are also engravings made, uh, I think, in Paris based on Champlain's notes and sketches and things like that. So it seems also pretty clear that someone in Paris had a little, you know, some French engraver had a little wigwam stamp and they were going around. And, whoop, 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 whoop. and if, this, if the, these things were anything like to some approximation of scale, these would be 80 foot high wigwams. So I don't I think it depicts the character of the landscape in ways that are really interesting to archaeologists. But I, 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 I don't know. I think it's, it's getting carried away to say oh, a building was there. Yeah. or something like that. And he missed some things too, right? Like Biddeford Pool, for instance. Yes, yeah, Biddeford Pool ought to be on there. Um, isn't that raises a few questions about, um, you know, visibility and the tide and, and all these things. But if we look at what he lays down in terms of the ocean, some pretty small islands are pretty accurately placed. He's, he's got um, soundings, he's got notated points for anchorages and things like that in a way that really is it seemingly pretty, I don't know, I, 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 the phrase accurate is maybe not that useful when we're going back 400 years, but you know what I mean. Um, it's a it's a better and more useful nautical chart than it is map. It's the NOAA chart, not the DeLorme. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's And I think it's very similar to what in New Brunswick we encounter with the, the Champlain's map of Wigudi, this place at the mouth of the, the Wolostog that, that is like Navy Island. And, and you know, it is a nautical chart with with the mouth of the river looking not really how it looks, um, but that he depicts what appears to be some kind of fortified village at the mouth of the river. And, and, and it's not clear where that actually was um, and, and what, you know, what he actually saw. Um, and, but the description's kind of in the same idea that it seems to be more accurate uh, out on the water than it does uh, uh, with depicting what's going on in the land. There's a very large mountain in the, in the depiction of Wigudi that I don't think exists uh, in the stratovolcano look that it has in, in, the, in the chart that he makes for the mouth of the Wolostok, So yeah. There are a few situations where it seems like it wouldn't have hurt for Champlain to do a little bit more follow-up. You know, these, these maps <laughs> maybe actually ask the St. Lawrence uh, Iroquoian where they were heading, you know, all these kinds of, <laughs> all these kinds of questions. Or one of the reasons I get to thinking about this is that this is from the the Maine Ark Society Bulletin in part, um, but uh, Tim Spar and work over in Kennebunkport um, in thinking about depictions of fish weirs um, has done some interesting comparisons of um, it's it's the 16th century work by John White down around Virginia, but he's um, compared the original sketches versus the published engraving. Um, and, I, and I don't think we have Champlain's original sketches, but we do have the published engravings. And so it gives us a little bit of, uh, of a sense of how much, it, you know, approximately this time period, European um, engravers were kind of formalizing some of the depictions that arrived in, 
in the sketch form, uh, which I think is an interesting thing to think about too. Great. Um, so you are not the first person to work at this site. <laughs> far, far from. <laughs> Could you give us a little bit of a history of the research agenda at this site? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, um, as you say, the, the existence of this chart and these accounts by Champlain, which, which appear to depict, you know, a thing and, and we'll, we'll get into villages, but he appears to depict a village, a late woodland village Champlain comes to see. So I think for a long time, there's been a perception that this is something we should be able to go find. And that has led to a lot of, um, a lot of archeological work at, at wildly varying levels of, of formality and, and stuff that's actually, um, a little bit difficult to, to track down. The earliest stuff I've seen, and there's there's a wonderful photograph um, in the Biddeford newspaper. It's 1951 of uh, a, a cheerful looking uh, Curtis Chapin, who's described as a traveling archaeologist, um, part of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Um, he is pulling a fragment of clay pipe out of the ground and handing it to an equally cheerful looking monk from what was then St. Francis College. And, uh, I, and I've been looking around a little bit, um, trying to find papers or information. Some finds would be ideal, but from, from Chapin's work, because we really don't know where he was digging. It, it is, you know, his diggings are said to be associated with Champlain's map um, and, and associated with St. Francis College, but um, which would become the University of New England. So kind of somewhere on our campus, wherever he thought that Champlain's chart was showing something, he was digging some holes and we don't really have um, any, any other record of that. Um, at St. Francis college became uh, the university of new England uh, in the, the sort of early days in the sixties um, or, or St. Francis college was becoming the university of new England. Um, one of the profs there, a guy named Fred Warner, um, who was later active in archeology span in Connecticut, I think. And that's a, a thread that I need to chase up. He apparently did some work there with students um, and excavated some things. And it was said that the artifacts were on display in the library. But that's that's not the library we have now. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some question about about those. And um, and, and I think Warner left the real um, Indiana Jones type situation. There's you're going to need to get one of those yeah, uh, pylons with the uh, the red the red <laughs> and, and there'll be an X in the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not having found any of that yet, um, my, my hope or thought is that um, when Warner went off to Connecticut um, after his time at, at St. Francis slash um, he might have taken those with them and they, they might still be somewhere. There's also throughout like the, the sort of 70s and 80s, like 79 and 80, um, there was a period of more survey going on uh, and, and more sort of organized survey in York County. And there were were test pits. Uh, Dick Doyle and Nate Hamilton from USM um, did a few test pits. Um, you have a, a pretty good sense of where those were. Um, and uh, and some of the artifacts uh, they recovered. Um, Tad Baker, uh, previously mentioned, was at the Sokka Museum and uh, I think uh, adjuncted for a moment uh, or was briefly at UNE teaching. Um, and he did a little bit of work. But we don't have a good sense of, of where I don't yet have a good sense of where all of those um, test bits were and exactly what people were finding. It, but I think a lot of this, um, a lot of this early test pitting makes sense based on what we've sort of um, subsequently begun to investigate, that this is a really, a really widely scattered archaeological area, little patches of, of preservation, almost within bedrock crevices and things like that. But one could test pit for a long time without feeling like you found it. And it's like the landscape for the for the listener. If you you know, I would I would recommend googling sort of the University of uh, New England's Biddeford campus and just kind of looking at the the area that we're talking about here. But your work and a lot of folks' work has focused basically on the like near coastal um, area along there. But I, I'm guessing too that like uh, you're what what we're seeing in Champlain's chart and and what sort of the description of this area would include sort of the landscape on which the university itself is built, um, some of its outbuildings and things, and the community, the surrounding community, basically. So, like, the scope of it is far, probably far exceeds a lot of where the archaeological work is focused. Is that Would that be fair? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of focus around the, the, the river mouth area, the, the south bank of the Saco. Um, but, yeah, again, if we look at the, if we look at the chart, depicted as a, as a pretty dispersed landscape, and I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, villages and kind of get back to that idea. So, 
there's just a wide area of potential but thin archaeological, you know, seems to be the case. And there have been um, some, even just like patches of shell associated with university construction, um, but that you know, never really panned out into um, a lot of archaeology, but but traces. So there's there's some of that associated with construction with the university, but but the big push um, in terms of CRM work came in the late 90s when the university was building uh, a marine science center, which is a tricky thing to do when you want um, a circulating seawater system. So they they need uh, water for coming in. infinity pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the infinity pool for the seal rehab center and they, that was that was a little bit complicated um and there was a huge amount uh, or at least for the time a huge amount of crm work done um by trc incorporated um and it's like i think the earliest kind of phase one might have been in 97 um through to about 2000 um so they put in a few hundred test pits um really I think narrowed down some of these areas in the, the river bank and the coast where there are denser and, and to some degree stratified archaeological deposits. And I, and I don't know that that had necessarily been spotted before or, or recognized before. Um, and uh, that some of that went to phase two um, and even a small phase three in order to clear the way for the construction of the Marine Science Center. And then in 1999 um, and 2005, um, Rick Will was working there, and, and uh, Karen Mack as well wrote a lot of the, the, the reports, um, ran a field school under the auspices of the Abbey Museum. And those field schools concentrated on uh, the area that we are working in now, which uh, I guess I'll, I'll talk about more momentarily, but um, this area, kind of a, a back beach area. Uh, right down by the, uh, the, the shores of Saco Bay and the south bank of the Saco River. So that was, um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of a rundown, right? That large-scale CRM work uh, kind of helped focus on areas where there seemed to be uh, the potential for some stratigraphy and some interesting 17th century items. The, what we found is that the potential stratigraphy and the 17th century items don't actually overlap that much, but, <laughs> but there are, are some areas of, of denser archaeology um, that we're able to look at. And I, and I think what's been interesting about this, um, and, I, and I've been working on, you know, since I started, restarted excavations there in 2017, um, been working on try to, trying to collate some of this older material, because I think having this site associated with Champlain's chart and Champlain's account, the people have been kind of test pitting for half a century, but never, you know, there wasn't quite what felt like the big discovery and subsequent publication. And, um, the work from TRC produced some great technical reports. Um, the work from those field schools didn't turn into publications. Um, so trying to get some of that uh, data back. So it, it's become, um, you know, despite some great archaeology occurring there, it's become one of those sites that everyone has heard about. Um, there isn't much about in print. Um, so I, I think a lot of a certain number of things get projected on it particularly when it comes to these ideas of the proto-historic and particularly ideas of villages. So I'm, right? so, I'm getting the sense from you, Arthur, that thus far, Shuakoet has not been found. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that, might, that might be a bold claim. I think we've got some ideas about where I think we're circling it. But, um, you know, and, and various folks have, have approached that with... Um, you know, I, I think varying degrees of confidence that like this is it, but um, delicately. But yeah, put. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think I think the archaeological remains. Um, yeah, tell an interesting story once we stop village hunting, and I think with that story, actually ends up telling us something about um, villages. Um, but I guess I, I should also say that yeah, I, I started work there in in 2017, um, and we've done various excavations and, and bits of analysis on and off. Um, it's been, um, you know, great having a, a site on campus, which is, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and being able to run, um, really low barrier field schools there. Um, the, uh, various parts of the university in new England have been, uh, really, really helpful in working on this. It's been great to work with our uh, environmental uh, science, and marine science programs on, on some, uh, analysis of, of remains and working with students and stuff. So, Particularly, um, you know, there's a lot of shellfish and fish remains and things like that that um, are great opportunities for students to study. And that's enabled some stuff that's, you know, beyond my expertise, um, which has been fun to, to be a part of. And uh, uh, some folks at Middlebury have been working on uh, the bird remains, particularly the great auk remains from the site. Yeah, we're actually going to so, have uh, Lucia on uh, in, a, in maybe not next fortnight, but one of the fortnights. 
Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. Um, so, um, some, yeah, some exciting stuff has come from that. And I think we've got, um, approaching things, um, a little bit differently. I think we put together a little bit different picture of the site and trying to get some stuff in print, but I, but I also recognize that I'm, I'm trying to put some material out there and understand the site and get some things published, but as part of a long history of people working on this site and sort of changing ideas of this site. And so, um, you know, welcome input. Um, if, if anyone knows anything about you know, Curtis Chapin or Fred Warner's work, um, or, or, or anything else that might've gone on there that I don't know about. I'll say, you know, Karen Mack has been in particular, has been uh, wonderful about sharing information from the TRC work and, uh, and all of that stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of a long line. Yeah. Sort of a, there's two, there's two scales here. There's sort of the archeology span and then the archeology span of the archeology. span Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, we, we have uncovered, uh, previous archeological work in our excavations, which has actually kind of helped us tie some of that together. Uh, in, in terms of mapping, in terms of spatial analysis, and figure out who was doing what, where, when. And so uh, we talked a little bit, I guess, about what the archaeologists were doing, uh, when and where, um, but we have not talked very much about what you've actually found. Um, and so could you give us just a little bit of a rundown about uh, what what is the site, to, to your understanding? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and and what you do, Arthur, while you do this, I'll take notes and then we'll type it up and that'll be the paper. So you just talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, you, you jump anytime uh, in anytime as you've been out there with me uh, this this season and others. The area where the the larger scale archaeological work was taking place and, you know, and not just, you know, test pits or a small phase two or three for a building um, is sort of right behind the. Um, what's known as, as Freddie Beach on the south bank of the Saco River on the campus of the University of New England. Um, it's not a huge area, and it's it's one that, I don't know, based on some of what we thought about this summer, and I think we'll talk about later, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious of saying it's an area where we've got stratigraphy, but I guess I'll say it's an area where we've, we've got depth. So it's it's this sort of bowl-shaped back beach area, you know, a, you know, a classic uh, bit of bedrock on either side. It's at the bottom of a hill. So it seems to be this place where... where sedimentation has, has happened. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot quick, but I'm not a superficial geologist or, or a sedimentologist or anything. But um, we have uh, storms and winds pushing sand in from the beach um, that's covering stuff up. We have the potential for hill wash, and we have the potential for the river flooding and depositing sediment on this sort of low back beach area before the rivers were dammed up in Biddeford, Saka. So it is a deep area of the site. You know, in some cases, we've gone down the glacial till that's been nearly nearly a, a little over a meter, nearly a meter and a half down. Uh, in other places, we have um, not reached glacial till, uh, even after going pretty deep. Uh, so there are, are there are deep sediments in there, um, though the interaction, I suppose, of sediment and stratigraphy is, is something that we've got to think somewhat carefully about. But it's this area where we have material building up that preserves archaeology. The character of some of the uh, previous test pits um, in, in talking to you know people like Dick Doyle uh, and talking to some of the TRC folks who worked there and reading those reports. And we've gone out and dug a few of our own in some of these areas where there there is seemingly some interesting archaeology, but there's not a lot of that stratigraphy. I mean, one of the units that we excavated, uh, I forget what year it was, but we had um, we had two projectile point fragments, but we also had like a 22 shell casing and a burnt piece of Coke bottle and uh, a European gun flint, and the whole thing was about eight inches deep. So it's it's churned up in many other places, but but the spot um, behind the beach does seem to have some some depth to it. Based on on what we've seen, m- my interpretation is that we're looking at kind of, a, I've, I've half sarcastically and then with increasing confidence used the term uh, working waterfront. When we look at what we see there in the artifactual record and what we don't see there in a sense it seems more like uh you know even back then it was it was this kind of beach area uh it was it was a working area that's at least my best interpretation of some of the sort of contradictions that we see you know there there seem very there, there's a lot of evidence for burning for example i i, I we haven't encountered quite well, that, what that would be member two i believe <laughs> well, well, yeah. um <laughs> We haven't encountered quite what you'd call a hearth yet, but there's, uh, you know, firecrack rock, a lot of just just smears and tiny bits of charcoal. So you've got a lot of fires being lit, but they're they're not in association with what seem to be consistently reused hearths and certainly no domestic architecture that we've seen any evidence for. 
but you mentioned too that you've you've recovered a lot of like faunal remains. So like they're cooking all sorts. You know, they're consuming shellfish. They're cooking great ox apparently, and and uh, uh, among other things. Yeah, a lot of faunal remains that suggest um, you know the, the great vague archaeological word processing, right? But we've got spirally fractured cervid long bone, right? You're, so you're using some of these big pots, boiling down bone grease and things like that. The bits and pieces we have, you know, some lovely bits of like deer pelvis with cut marks on. So we're finding the smashed up long bones, we're finding the pelvises, we're finding the teeth, we're finding these bits and pieces, but we're not necessarily finding faunal evidence for the nice pieces you might bring home to roast. Right. Sturgeon scoot in many areas is, is well, practically a soil inclusion, uh, you know, burnt tiny fragments of sturgeon scoot coming up all the time. Right? And if you're using this place to burn the scoots off of a big sturgeon you just hauled out of the river that's going to make a huge mess but you're cutting that up to bring home right. <laughs> which which this uh and, you know this perhaps isn't that domestic sphere necessarily that cooking sphere there are some sort of lenses of, of clamshell um which uh really give extraordinary preservation in some situations um it's a bit of a flight of fancy but all of the piles of clamshell we've come across seem to me like about a about an arm load you know about a big basket full being dumped somewhere so a lot of the the ceramic and the faunal evidence um and the sort of lack of, of clear site structure um in, in some cases seems to me to point to this as this kind of post hunting activity area you know you're, you're hauling up the canoe you're taking out the catch or the results of the hunt and it, it, it really is an, a pretty large and extraordinary ceramic assemblage and, and some of the vessels uh, and, and on our analysis is still ongoing and, and karen mack has done some on, on the uh earlier work but the some of the vessels are huge and some of them are pretty old too cp two and three which in this case does not stand for champlain two or champlain two <laughs> yeah. yeah. so, so yeah. thousand years old yeah that's i i should have noted that before we got into this it, it's, uh, it's middle woodland just predominantly middle woodland and we see similar things with the the lithics or i have a similar interpretation from the lithics was that we, there's a fair amount of debitage but it's all tiny you know, and, and it seems more like um, reworking, resharpening, finishing than it does real production of stone tools. Yeah, which kind of goes with the idea that if they're, you know, processing food and a catch and stuff like that, eh? Yeah, exactly. And um, so I think some equipment maintenance, right? So we've seen um, in, in this this year we had um, a nice little Kineo projectile point that sure looked like it was about to be corner notched, you know? <laughs> And on the other end of the spectrum, we see a lot that are broken in half or, or resharpened just down to little nubs and probably discarded. One thing that's been interesting for a, a middle to late woodland site is that we have very, very few scrapers. Again, suggesting that you're, you might be taking the skins and folding them up and taking them elsewhere. Um, and the, for, for those types of what we might consider domestic tasks. And the scrapers that we do have are, are predominantly pretty rough around the edges, right? These are not your, your you know exotic lithic thumbnail scraper. These are... Um, you know, beat up, uh, just about unifacial tool of, of quartz or something like that. And so just to recap here a little bit on one of the, because you talked about the stratigraphy and we've also talked about the time depth of the site. Um, right. Part of the complication is that, that in this particularly sandy um, uh, site where, where soil is actually accreting, one of the problems is that you've got kind of a stratigraphic smoosh of middle woodland mixed in with probably late woodland and probably protohistoric material. And and that's something that I think after our uh, this season of excavations, we understand quite a bit better. Um, and and uh, I mean, it's just the result of, of a lot of conversations about this with you, Gabe. But my initial impression was that um, what we were seeing um, in these sort of layers of sand with a lot of artifacts, but not a lot of structure may have been that human occupation was being disrupted by floods and storms and things like that. And then people were just coming back, right? Because you, you don't have architecture being disturbed or something like this. If this is this beach activity area, yeah, like and a, then maybe there's some, some old hearths and tools and bits of sturgeon and deer knocking around, and then it gets walloped by a storm, and then, frankly, you come back the next day and you just keep doing what you were doing. Um, and that could be part of what's going on. As we've, I think, understood this better, you know, that's, that's almost certainly a part of things, but also um, – as we've found archaeological remains of previous test pits and previous excavations, and, and particularly as we've seen the results of the storm in January, which uh, knocked out our datum and dumped a lot of sand on the site, we've seen how fast this really can accumulate. So I think the idea, you know, it's becoming clear that the, um, 
the enormous jetties that were installed um, around the mouth of the river uh, to try to control some of this erosion. But but have actually um, to the north of the site led to 100 feet. There's a huge erosion in the last century, a community called Camp Ellis, which is um, internationally known as an example of pretty catastrophic coastal erosion. These jetties have caused accretion on the front of the, uh, the site at UNE, on the front of 506. Um, so rather than, or, or not say rather than, some of the areas of the site along the right by the riverbank are being eroded, but some of the areas of the site along the beach are being buried. Um, and that's kind of a complex interplay. Really getting a sense this year because of those storms of how much sand could be dumped on this at once uh, and maybe how quickly that cap of sand, you know, maybe half a meter has built up in the last century or so. You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of this idea that the amount of sand, the amount of sort of clean sand potentially in this inundated, waterlogged, sandy soil during a storm is just squashing any remains of stratigraphy that we might once have had. Um, and, and ultimately, that you know, this stuff has been under a lot, like a very literal lot of pressure. So it's getting kind of compressed and deflated at the same time with all of these major storm events, basically, right? And just, so it's like yeah. getting compressed, deflated, but then covered up and, and then mixed in with a whole bunch of other stuff every time these storm events come in. And, and so it's, it's doing, it's like a friend of mine used to do this shuffling technique where he'd put all the the cards on the table he call it the blender and he'd just kind of <laughs> stir everything around on the table so that it, uh, <laughs> yeah i i think that's a great analogy for it um did you want to add to that game i mean um, talked a lot. no no I, the the one thing i i think that would be interesting though and and that relates to some work that we've all actually been interested in um and also that matt Betts has done a lot of work on is just this idea about the how this makes the the protohistoric period sort of archaeologically really, really hard to find. Yes. And so you don't have very many protohistoric artifacts. Like it's not like there's artifacts with Champlain's initials floating around. No, we've got some, and I think they're um and I think they're really exciting. But no, I, I think this does help us articulate some of the challenges of looking for the proto-historic. And we run into this in the, in the Quadi region as well, in that you know, we spent a long time looking for it. And we, we found enough, but not much. We found some, but not much, right? And it, and it, seemed, like, it seemed like maybe there should be more or there should be none. But the very small amount we found was kind of puzzling. I think one of the issues here, is, you know, to be honest, if the, if the proto-historic is at the, uh, the end of a long sequence then it doesn't have, there's no late proto-historic being deposited on top of it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of the ground surface, right? And, and I think there are some real issues with, you know, how or whether or not the proto-historic actually gets incorporated into the archaeological record and the stratigraphy of the site that it might be sitting on top of. So I, I, I think that's an interesting thing about this site. Um, what we've also found is that the, um, there are some potential proto-historic and some early artifacts in the area that we have been um, digging in. But there are, are sort of more um, stretching out along the riverbanks and that the, the distribution seems to be wider and thinner for proto-historic stuff than it is for anything else. Um, based on some finds by the river and stuff, we, we think there may be an earlier woodland component that's now underwater. We've, we've got a predominantly middle to maybe late component where we've been excavating. There do seem to be... Um, potentially early 17th century materials kind of scattered all over. Which isn't inconsistent. Like, you know, it's funny because like we, we've talked about this a few times, but this is kind of an ongoing conversation, which it sounds like there's sort of, you know, it's a puzzling time period for people, but anybody who sort of approached it in the last 10 or 15 years, what kind of consistently is coming up is that the sites seem small, distributed, task specific, um, and increasingly, we're getting an understanding that technologically, the proto-historic or proto-contact um, is incredibly hard to, to parse out from late woodland technology. You know, like Adrian's, uh, uh, made, Adrian Burke has made this argument that, like, I mean, corner notch points are demonstrably into 17th and potentially even 18th century contexts, right? And and so, you know, you don't have that smoking bronze projectile point or, or, you know, a a tinkling cone or something like that, that kind of like, or a glass bead. Um, And without all that stuff, we, you know, it could be, you could be looking at 500 years 
uh, with, you know, a whole bunch of what looks to be one deposit. And what it sounds like is that all this stuff is smashed together. You could be looking at something from, you know, 1400 to 1800 kind of thing. And I think we're also getting more sophisticated with believing our protohistoric radiocarbon dates. Um, and that's something that looks like a late woodland component, but has a protohistoric radiocarbon date. And, and this is this is like what I've run into with my masters, where I, you yeah. know, I, I I took the 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 bad dates approach that uh, you know that uh, it, it it was too puzzling for me to understand uh, twelve years ago, uh, but is actually more interesting now that I look at it. Yeah, it's it's a I think kind of. I think we're increasingly trying to understand it as we're tr- in the same way we try to understand other cultural transitions, right, in uh, in the archaeological record. Um, and so I'm, I'm mindful of, of everyone's Courvoisier status and of the and of the time here. But one thing, uh, Arthur, wait, 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 wait about- it's not a Courvoisier status for you today. This is this, this, we can. <laughs> Arthur and I are looking at, you know, what looks to be a pitcher full of, of uh, is, is that, uh, what is that? Is that a mint julep in uh, over your shoulder, Gabe? That's, uh, that is a great question. I'm looking over my shoulder here and I'm seeing some tiki glasses. Um, and I don't want to say. I'm looking at your skirt and I'm seeing some tiki glasses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I'm looking into the future here. Uh, and and it, uh, it's it's quite a it's quite a selection, um, and I think I'm also going to be enjoying them poolside, which will be quite exciting. That sounds lovely. Yeah, yeah. If I was poolside right now, I would be I would be uh, incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> Same here. The uh, well, me too, because I, I would have a um, an extension cord stretching across the pool <laughs> in a way that looked like uh, you know one of those uh, one of those public safety announcements. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd need my toque, I think, is the problem for me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. The um, oh yeah, we're having the opposite problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're in a heat dome over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which I gather is not a problem in Lethbridge. No, we're. Uh, what would be the opposite of a dome? Uh, like a, we're in a heat caldera. I think is the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yeah. Well, and and, and obviously we'll, we'll each have a, a glass of. We're drinking a glass of, of champagne while we do this. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The finest. Yeah. yeah. Although I think I think if you're from this this part of the world, it's it's we actually just have to call it a glass of sparkling. Half my men died in Saint Croix, but yeah, the, or like a proto secco or something. You know. Pro, oh, yeah. proto secco is good. Yeah. Yeah. That's not bad. The, um, yeah. Or or proto sacco actually for you guys wouldn't it be? Uh... Oh, it could be. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, but but Arthur, since we're talking about glassware, um, we found a fairly believable piece of flaked glass, and and that's not something you hear every day. No, it's not. Um, and it's something I'd been I'd been looking into, and I. I something of an interest in flaked glass. I've been looking into this enough to become deeply skeptical. And then of course found a piece on my own excavation, which is how that goes. And yeah, we'd like to do some XRF or something. Um, this could end up being a sort of embarrassing thing to be talking about on this podcast. But um, in the end, I, you know, it doesn't look like any Corona bottle I've ever seen. And certainly the, uh, the remains of beach parties are a feature much higher up in the stratigraphic column. But yeah, we, um, and Ken, you're a zapper, aren't you? I mean, I, I don't do archaeology that requires uh, lead underwear, but I know that you're prone to this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I guess you could probably, I guess the idea is to pick up on the um, different tempering agents in the glass that could give you an indication of, you know, what, uh, you know, what level of arsenic or whatever they, uh, whatever poison was was uh, used as flux in that that particular era of glass. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got to read up on this, but my, my thought is that, it, you know, even if XRF can't definitively say it's 17th century French case bottle, uh, it can probably differentiate old from Bombay Sapphire. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, we can, we can work with that, but it's, it's also a, yeah, it's also a pretty convincing flake, which I, which is a debatable thing, but it's also pretty convincing. Flake. So, um, so, but again, though, like I think, I, I don't think flaked glass is, is totally out of the question. I think the context is also pretty, is is pretty critical for when you're looking at flake glass, but uh, but I, like I'm, it's not in a stockyard. Yeah, but I mean, you know, like there's oral history uh, among the Wolostogwig, for example, about using flake glass um, for like like cutting fiddleheads and stuff like that. Yeah, there's some, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff, um, and and I think increasing recognition that Europeans were working with glass tools as well, which really complicates some things. But um, uh, 
But I think that's an interesting one. And we do, again, from the area of the site that we've been working in, um, we've, we've got a, a, a wonderful glass bead, um, which is, is always exciting to talk about. It's, it's a, one of the Cornelian Delep forms, um, which seemingly pretty early. There's a very similar one from Popham. Um, As we looked around which, the field school this summer, actually, we thought to ourselves that in addition to our usual dress code, we may have to add a ban on students wearing beaded bracelets as we... Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we that started out as a joke, and then we thought, oh, oh actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it could uh, become no, very no confusing. small blue glass bead bracelets. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, but I, I found that really interesting, um, and it's something that I use when I, I, I kind of give a lot of tours of the site or talk about the site um, and why it's important with people who may not have a lot of background in archaeology, but you know, we've got this thing on campus to talk about it for each student's time. Um, but the beads are an, uh, an interesting thing to, to sort of show off and make a point, and I think a point about why these proto-historic sites are really important, um, which is that we've got this, you know, what it, it seems to be early 17th century. It's this bead of a style that is named after a city in Syria that was produced in Amsterdam or Venice for global trade uh, in various colonial situations, and it's made its way all the way across the Atlantic. And a uh, Wabanaki person on this uh, in this area of wanted to use that, you know, traded for that, that became part of their world. Um, and that's, I think, always an important point about um, a site like this being a reminder that the woodland and the proto-historic and, and, and you know, prehistory in general, Scotland, people were living in big worlds. Um, the, the stuff was moving around and then, you know, increasing recognition, I think, is the Wabanaki as a political and naval and military force in the 16th and 17th century in, in ways that I think historians haven't really talked about um, as much until recently. Um, so I think it's part of an interesting story about why these proto-historic sites are important, and this one in particular, because, you know, uh, Champlain was, you know, look at his accounts. Um, he'd been kept alive by the past Maquati the winter before. He was in somebody else's world. He was in somebody else's power structure, and he was aware of that. You know, this is a different a somewhat at least different type of early colonial encounter than we'd see even 15 years later. Um, and, and that's where it gets important to look at the archaeology that can tell both sides of the story and, and not lean too hard on the, the written account from a white guy that people tend to gravitate towards as uh, an idea of what really happened. And on that subject there, Arthur, <laughs> of the uh, of Wabanaki world, um, one of the things that I think is interesting is in the in the written accounts, you get the sense of, you know, maybe the Saco River or certainly that area of being some kind of a boundary area. You know, in the 1500s, you've got Verrazano kind of shows up and says, folks here are different. Once you cross the camera the Saco River, one of the southern main rivers, um, Champlain kind of implies the Saco River is sort of boundary area. What are your impressions about about that idea? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, I... I think the archaeology in these accounts show some kind of boundary or some kind of change, you know, occurring around there. I think it's really easy to read too much into that because we, you know, archaeologists have a tendency to really like to draw lines on maps, um, which obscures um, a lot about how people really live their lives. And it's particularly important not to do that when we're talking about uh communities that are, are also often marginalized, but are still around today. Well, those lines on a map aren't that helpful. Um, so yeah, you know, Champlain notes that um, there seems to be a language shift around the Saco when he starts to get down there, though, you know, to what degree that's, you know, people speaking a different language or kind of a different dialect or to what degree things are changing, I, I think is not totally clear. Um, I think that's important to note. Um, I think we do see a... I mean, we certainly see a, a shift, you know, and not to go environmentally determinist, but we see a shift in the character of the coastline. You know, you, you, you kind of get around Cape Elizabeth and it's big arcing sandy beaches down to Cape Cod as opposed to the, the rock bound coast of Maine as you go north. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a pretty real shift that we would maybe expect some ways of living to coincide with. But that, uh, that doesn't mean people thought of themselves as all that different, you know, um, that you know, living a little bit differently in a little bit of a different environment doesn't necessarily make those people different from other people. Um, one of the things that's been written about a lot or thought about a lot, particularly with regard to the site, is horticulture, because Champlain shows up and he, he really finds it notable that these the people of the Saco River, people at Shuakoa, are the first people he's seen growing corn beans as well. Um, 
And I think a lot has been read into that to make this a boundary. Um, but that's kind of an example of the ways in which the, the you know colonial gaze sort of ossifies ways in which we think of dynamics in the late woodland. Because Champlain also records, and I'm less familiar with this part, maybe I'm getting wrong, but basically up by the Kennebec, he talked to people and said, well, I, you're not growing anything. And they say, yeah, we did, but it didn't really work out that well. So we saw. So if, if Veranzano had paid more attention, would the northern boundary of horticulture be the Kennebec instead of the Saka? Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's just, I think, a point about the debatable usefulness of of drawing those hard lines. So yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a boundary, environments are changing, people are changing, but I, but I don't think it's a hard line um, in a way that kind of divides people or can be used to categorize people in the past. Yeah, it's, it's also just like functionally, you're in Southwest of Maine, so you're probably encountering different groups of people. You are closer to Northern New England and you're closer to the Great Lakes and places like that where you're, you know, you're probably, you're a shorter distance away from what we know to be neighbors, basically, to the Wabanaki. Yeah, and I, and I think um, you know one of the things that I think is interesting because I'm a nerd about this is is that the the lithics kind of show this like there's some of the classics like Munsungan um, and a lot of Kineo, but there's also a huge amount of stuff coming up from Boston, which I don't think we see as much too too far further north. Arthur, on this podcast, we like to use the phrase "alleged Munsungan." <laughs> <laughs> um, and I we also have a lot of material from Nova Scotia, alleged material from alleged Nova Scotia. Um, which I think is interesting because, you know, in the middle woodland, the biggest source of quote unquote exotic lithic seems to be Nova Scotia. And by the proto historic period, the folks from Nova Scotia are um, uh, the Mi'kmaq are coming across and, and attacking the village, um, which is indicative of close relationships, even if it's not going well. So, yeah, that, I guess that's my you know reflection on on boundaries. And I know this this ties in. Maybe we don't have time to get into it. This ties in with kind of the village question, but but I, I think the idea that we've got a, a chart that shows this really widely dispersed landscape, and we've got this like keyhole view into an activity area within that landscape, I, I think lends support to the idea that um, this concept of dispersed villages is kind of the reason that archaeologists haven't been finding. Get back to the idea that we. You know, we say we can't find them, but really they don't look like what we expect. So. And so actually, I, I think that's almost a perfect setup for our great citations segment here if you, to, <laughs> if you wanted to stay on uh and uh you know ordinarily ken and i would do the great citations without you but since you're here and you really just set up what we're having as our great citation this uh this fortnight should, should i should i fire up zotero in, in my uh other screen here and search yourself <laughs> some hard questions yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah no no i think uh our, our great citation if you remember on page 511 you uh <laughs> We do it bar trivia style, um, but the citation is, it's uh, Arthur Anderson, 2022, and it's the, the village of Shuakoet and the ceramic and protostoric periods on Saco Bay, Maine, and that's in a book that we know is uh, near and dear to the listener's heart or possibly working as their monitor stand uh, called <laughs> Far Northeast 3000 BP to Present, uh, edited by Ken and I, published by the Canadian Museum of history mercury series uh and that's ottawa university press and so one of the things that i think uh i like about that article arthur is that you actually applied your perspective of working at a in a proto-historic period uh on a different continent to the proto-historic period you're dealing with in southern maine and you talk a bit about the village problem and so do you want to riff on that for a minute yeah i mean i i I guess the problem seems to be that, and, and I don't know, correct me if this is uh, too much of an oversimplification, but we've got all these, all these Europeans. Um, I never think explorer is a good word, right? Like if I showed up at your I house, know it, <laughs> I started rooting around and taking things I wouldn't be exploring, uh, even if I'd never been there before. But um, we have these accounts of people visiting um, Wabanaki villages uh, in the 1600s. And what we don't really have archaeologically, at least along the coast, are um, really good examples of Wabanaki villages. <laughs> um, and people have tended to explain that in some different ways. I mean, um, uh, 
could be some preservation issues. Maybe we're just looking in the wrong place. Maybe they're underneath Portland and Bangor and Fredericton, um, all of these other suggestions. But, but I think the one that is, um, the one that to me is the most compelling and the one that I think our work at 506 lends support to is the idea that these are uh, what's referred to as dispersed villages, that we're not going to get, you know, archaeological signatures of, uh, you know, here is Main Street, Right. And I think, you know, back to the idea of John White's engravings in the uh, 16th century, that they, they show village, you know, houses next to each other, uh, roadways, things that Europeans would clearly recognize as villages. But maybe that's not how things worked up here. Um, so, yeah, my, my sense would be that given the the what we see on the University of New England campus is um, a early 17th century account of what seems to be a village, perhaps for social organizational purposes, but the depiction is of a sort of dispersed landscape. And, and when we get a, a view of that, we have certain areas where we can pin down like activity areas, cascapes. Uh, you can take the boy out of Durham, but the, the Ingold remains. Is that <laughs> <it>? <laughs> there you go. Um, and then uh, across a much wider area, um, we don't have a lot of soil buildup. We don't have a lot of stratigraphy or preservation, but we get these kind of smears of archaeology around that. That, that looks uh, to me a lot like maybe the some compelling evidence for the idea that um, if you have some pretty shallow soils, you have a lot of development since the 17th century, and you have you know a couple of wigwams and a couple of fields that may be 100 yards away from the nearest couple of wigwams and couple of fields, altogether this produces a village, but the archaeological signature of that is going to be pretty minimal compared to what people have been looking for, and un- understandably have been looking for. Right. But but it's this um, process of trying to, to productively use the early European accounts um, without really unfairly prioritizing the written record of these people that were misunderstanding what they saw over what the archaeology tells us about the lives of the people that they were. Yeah. Encountering. Yeah. It's sort of like a like the picture is speaking more than a thousand words in a in a way that doesn't really isn't hasn't been super helpful to the archaeological interpretation of the area that you get. You've got. Yeah. yeah. It's more than a thousand words, but they're not in a language Champlain understands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, or I mean, you know, like the the uh, Champlain's interpretation of the of the chart is is totally different, and uh, but the, he just never wrote down what those what uh, what it was actually telling us. You know, the, just kind of this broad generalization about what he's what he's seeing. So, I mean, as a man who also outsources his GIS work, I can understand how this would happen. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, just to on the note of great citations here, Arthur, uh, is there anything else you would recommend uh, either your own work or someone else's work about uh, the site? Yeah, I would. Um, I, I'll have to send you some stuff for the show notes so I don't right. uh, embarrass myself um, in trying to remember all of the details and co-authors and things like that. But I would, you know, some of Tad Baker's ethno-historic work on the al uh, it's really good. And, uh, Arts Beast has, has sort of weighed in on some of these things. Um, there, uh, I, I should say that uh, Robert Lord did some interesting, there's a, there's a good um, Maine Archaeological Society bulletin article about... Um, analyzing the faunal remains from the site to try to determine if um, there's a, a clear um, change in how wild resources were being or, or, or animal resources were being used that could indicate an advent of horticulture. Um, and there isn't, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I think, too, uh, on the topic of dispersed villages, Alan Levely, uh, Joseph Waller, and Donna Ingram's Ingham's paper from 2006, Dispersed Villages in Late Woodland Period, South Central Coastal Rhode Island, which is in archaeology of Eastern North America, uh, would be a, a critical uh, a piece, too, that we would want to, that we'll throw in the show notes. Thank you for looking that up. Uh, that was what I was going to email you. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's entirely correct. But I, that, um, it's all right, yeah, Arthur. That, you that, already that, wrote it. That's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You've got a copy in front of you. Yeah, for the listener who can't see, Ken is checking Arthur's bibliography. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which somebody's got to do it. Um, um, so that's helpful. Um, and uh, what else I want to point out? Oh, Karen, Karen Mack has a great article about. Um, Middle Woodland Ceramics in one of the recent um, Maine Archaeological Society bulletins that that also um, draws a little bit from, you know, much more broadly, but also draws from some of our analysis of stuff at the, uh, the UNE site at 506, um, which I would also really recommend. Um, and I, yeah, it, if no one cuts me off, I'm just going to keep going. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, you, you mentioned Tascapes. So uh, what is it? Uh, um, <laughs> 
It is the what is it, the archaeology of landscape or the no? What is it? Uh, why can't I think of the name? Um, oh, it's just everything by Tim Ingold, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah just, you got to start <laughs> the temporality, of the landscape. There we go. You got to, but you got to yeah. start by pouring water over a stone. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of pouring things, in love the things, that. Um, I think we've perhaps reached the point where our glasses are empty, and Ken needs a hot toddy, and I need a daiquiri. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Arthur, I suspect, is uh, is also in the daiquiri zone, based on uh, based on the. Us, us occupying New England at the moment. Yeah, is there anything you wanted to share before we let you go, Arthur? No, I don't think so. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I can't wait to have a listen and be horrified at what I left out here. But um, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting site to talk about. Um, and I, I guess I, yeah, it's an interesting site to talk about. So thanks. Well, we appreciate you coming out to talk about it. It is indeed, as you said, an interesting site to talk about. And um, maybe we'll follow up soon once we've got things like new radio carbon dates and stuff from the site. So yeah. you can yeah. you can be confidently wearing that green jacket, uh, showing you in the lead here uh, on the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. Yeah, maybe uh, we'll do a live so, one from the beach here at some point. You know? Oh, we should. Oh yeah, that'd be great. When did you say you were coming uh, up this way in August, Ken? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I like that idea a lot. Let's do it. Shoot a code on location. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, Arthur. Well, we will talk to you soon, and thank you very much for uh, for joining to share uh, share about Site Five Hundred Six. Absolutely. Thanks, Arthur. Bye, guys. See you, Arthur. <laughs> he did it anyway. <laughs> listen, listener, we're we're wrapping up here, and uh, uh, we <laughs> we had given Arthur, who's a, who's a dear friend of both of us, uh, instructions to stay on after the interview, um, and he has promptly left left the Zoom yep. call. So that's all yeah. right. Yeah. Well, so, Ken, I guess that's our cue to leave the Zoom call too. <laughs> I think so. I think that I think that's a wrap. So, uh, Gabe, we'll we'll see you again tomorrow. Actually, um, we will. And uh, and listener, we will uh, talk to you again in a fortnight. And uh, looking forward to a couple of exciting episodes coming down the pipe here before we have a bit of a programming pause, uh, uh, sort of from mid July until mid August. Um, while Gabe goes on vacation, and I get myself out into the field and. Uh, um, take a, a few days off myself. That's right. But uh, we have hope your summer's uh, going good, listener, and we'll talk to you in a fortnight.